And here it is, lecture 13, the last lecture, food safety legisl legislation. It's easy for me to say. I hear you saying, hurrah, uh, it's been a long old journey from 1 to 13. Uh, so we're on the last lecture, it's not um, a particularly last, uh, long lecture like the last one. So the aim of this last module is to provide an understanding of the main food safety legislation and to outline the role of authorised officers and enforcement authorities. And learning outcomes by the end of this module, you will be able to name the latest regulation which looks at the hygiene of foodstuffs, give details of the Food Hygiene England Regulations 2006, that also covers Wales and Northern Ireland, state the responsibilities and powers of authorised officers and criteria for prosecution, and identify the legislation regarding the labelling and date coding of food. Uh, one thing I mentioned in the last slide was about the allergens, the 14 allergens. And how I said that we'd already covered that in previous slide. Actually, that wasn't entirely accurate. Uh, we will cover that in this section under labelling. So, food safety legislation consists of Acts of Parliament. These are principles of legislation. It consists of EU directives. Uh, these are member states uh, with the member state issues regulations. Um, EU regulations, these apply to all member states directly. Regulations, which are subordinate legislation to enforce requirements of acts and directives and to facilitate the enforcement of EU regulations. Really, an act is um, almost like a, a skeletal piece of legislation. Um, the regulations actually pull me more meat on the bones and more detail uh, is given. So food safety legislation, acts and regulations deal with unsafe or unfit food, contamination, hygiene, training, hygienic practices, provision of facilities, food poisoning, importation, composition, labelling, registration, licensing, offences and penalties. The regulation EC852-2004 on the hygiene of foodstuffs. Uh, in this regulation we find other, under section 5 HACCP, section 6 registration, number 8 national guides to good practice, uh, which provides general hygiene requirements for food premises and food rooms, market stores and vending, transport, equipment, food waste, water supply, personal hygiene, foodstuffs, wrapping and packaging, heat treatment and training. The Food Hygiene England Regulations 2006 contain the following, um, including temperature control, Chill holding, uh, 8 degrees C or below, unless it's hot food, there's no health risk, it's canned or dehydrated, it's raw, uh, less than 4 hours, that's the 4 hours uh, cold rule, uh, which means you can keep food, even high risk food actually, um, out of temperature control for no more than 4 hours. You can keep it at ambient temperature, but at the end of the four hours it must be destroyed or it must be um, sold by then. Hot holding, 63 degrees C or above, unless there's no risk um, due to a scientific assessment that's been carried out. Less than two hours for service and display. This is the two hour hot rule. Uh, if you've got food... Uh, say, for example, in a bain-marie, which you need to keep at 63 or above, if that hot food goes below 63 degrees C, say, for example, the equipment is broken down, then you've got two hours to sell it. At the end of the two hours, um, it is uh, legally okay to chill that food down and reuse the next day, uh, preferably as a cold product. It can be reheated. Uh, as long as it's reheated to 75 degrees C. And cold food. Also, uh, in, it includes enforcement. Uh, regulation 6 uh, includes hygiene improvement notices. 
Regulation 7, Hygiene Prohibition Orders. Uh, Regulation 8, Hygiene Emergency Prohibition Notices and Orders. And just a um, little side note there, the difference between a notice and an order. A notice can be provided by an enforcement officer, such as the EHP. An order can only be, be provided by a magistrate or court. Regulation 11 covers the due diligence defence. And just to go back on that, the due diligence defence really means that you've taken all reasonable precautions to prevent food poisoning or contamination to occur. Uh, regulation 15 to 22 covers offences, penalties and rights of appeal. Regulation 23 covers seizure of food, which fails to comply with food safety requirements. Statutory codes of practice. These are guidance on enforcement. They're a uniform standard. They're not legally binding. Uh, just gives EHPs guidance really on to how to follow the regulations. And actually businesses can use those same codes of practice to make sure they stay in, within the law. Uh, you've got the Food Law Code of Practice and the Food Law Practice Guidance. Uh, we've got National Guides to Good Practice, uh, developed by food businesses and trade associations. Uh, these really are the Bibles that businesses can follow because they're quite straightforward um, to follow, to understand. These are practical guidance notes. Um, they can be used by an authorised officer. Uh, they're quite consistent uh, throughout the UK. It's good practice. Uh, but our other alternatives are available. The Food Safety Act 1990 is, is really now, um, um, it's still the Food Safety Act, but the regulations have taken over more of the role of enforcement and guidance, etc. But still, under the Food Safety Act 1990, Section 7 uh, does state it's an offence to ren render food injurious to health, including a cumulative effect. Uh, section 9 gives the power to seize or detain food. Section 14, food is not of the nature, substance or quality demanded. Section 29 to 30, uh, where the enforcement officers can purchase and take food samples. Uh, section 32, they've got the power of entry at any reasonable time of the day or night. Uh, seizure and detention of records. Uh, and under indictment, uh, you can have an unlimited fine and two years imprisonment. Uh, those uh, penalties would take place in a Crown Court. Um, a magistrate's court uh, can only deal with limited fines and up to six months imprisonment. Although with the Manslaughter Act, uh, you can obviously go to prison uh, for up to seven years if you're found guilty of killing somebody uh, through your negligence uh, through food poisoning. Uh, summary conviction, uh, as I mentioned, that's the uh, magistrate's court, £20,000 fine, maximum and six months imprisonment. Investigative food complaints start with uh, an interview uh, where the person who is complaining about the food makes a statement. Uh, then the EHP uh, would contact the seller and they may caution them. Uh, they can then carry out an inspection. Uh, they can look at the due diligence defence of the uh, business. They can send anything away for analysis or they might have some analytical tools with them to check. And they then, if um, they're going to prosecute, well, they can't actually prosecute, so I mean the courts prosecute, they can gather all the available evidence and give it to the uh, courts then, or Crown Prosecution Service, to see if they will uh, prosecute. But they must caution uh, the business owner. And food labelling regulations, 1996, food must be labelled with the name of the food, the list of ingredients, best before date, or a use by date, special storage or use conditions, Name and address of the manufacturer, or packer, or seller. And Food Information Regulation December 2014 covers 
the allergens, the 14 allergens. Uh, the way allergens are labelled on prepacked foods has changed. The Food Information Regulation, which came into force in December 2014, introduced a requirement that all food businesses must provide information about the allergenic ingredients used in any food they sell or provide. So we're going to go through the 14 different allergens. Uh, again, it might be worth making notes about these. Uh, if even for your own business, uh, so you can uh, explain to customers the allergens that you work with on a daily basis. And again, an allergic reaction to food or allergens or uh, a reaction to uh, the allergen to food, this is all about communication. You must communicate to the customer uh, what's in your foods, what's on your menus, uh, what allergens are there. And they must communicate to you, or but usually they don't. Just ask them, you know, do you suffer from any allergic reactions to different foods? Um, and just put the list of the foods on the counter and just draw their notice to it on a regular basis. Uh, okay, let's start with uh, the first four. We've got celery, uh, celery stalks, leaves, seeds, and even celeriac. And you can find celery in different products so that's why it's important to read the ingredients for any celery salt salads and meat products soups and stock cubes cereals containing gluten wheat uh, we'll just read wheat rye and barley but wheat includes things like spelt and uh, khorasan and kamut uh, oats um, is something that some people are uh, allergic to um, so it might be worth mentioning that, although it doesn't contain gluten. Uh, but uh, these are often found, uh, wheat, rye and barley, they're often found in cool foods containing flour such as baking powder, batter, breadcrumbs, baked cakes, couscous, meat products, pasta, pastry, a whole gamut of stuff there which you'll find uh, flour in. Uh, number three is crustaceans. Uh, crabs, lobster, prawns, and scampi. Um, anything really with an external, uh, what we call an exoskeleton. Shrimp paste, often used in Thai and Southeast Asian curries or salad, is an ingredient to look out for. Because uh, they use it quite often in uh, red Thai curry and uh, green curries. Um, I personally like using it. It gives it a horrendous smell. But it, it does uh, offer or give... Uh, a certain je ne sais quoi to your dishes. Um, even just only Chinese dishes. It's excellent. Uh, well, not excellent if you're allergic to it. Uh, number four is eggs. Often found in cakes and meat products, mayonnaise, mousses, pasta quiche sauces, pastries, foods brushed or glazed with egg. Uh, number five is fish. Uh, find in fish sauces, pizzas, relishes, salad dresses, stock cubes, and Worcester sauce, where they use anchovies as the fish ingredient. Lupin, um, I always thought this was um, a flower, as in a plant. Uh, it is, but it's also found in flour. Lupin flour and seeds can be used in some types of bread, pastries and even pasta. Milk is a common ingredient in butter, cheese, cream, milk powders and yogurt. Also found in foods brushed or glazed with milk and in powdered soups and sauces. Mollusks uh, or bivalves uh, Anything, again, with an exoskeleton, um, mussels, land snails, not to bivalve, squid and whelks uh, are also classed as that. They can also be found in oyster sauce as an ingredient in fish stews. Um, oyster sauce, again, another lovely ingredient to be used with Chinese cookery. Again, that's a lovely if they are allergic to it. Next, uh, we've got mustard, uh, liquid, mustard powder and seeds. They can be found in breads, curries, curries, marinades, meat products, salad dressings, sauces and soups. Then we've got nuts, not to be mistaken with peanuts, which are actually a legume or a vegetable and grow underground. This ingredient refers to nuts which grow on trees, such as cashew nuts, almonds, hazelnuts. You can find nuts in breads, biscuits, crackers, desserts, nut powders, uh, which again you can find in Asian curries. Uh, Stir-fried dishes, ice cream, marzipan, nuts, oils and sauces. And peanuts. Uh, sometimes called a groundnut. 
uh, often uses uh, an ingredient of biscuits, cakes, curry, desserts, satay sauce, uh, or peanut butter. Uh, again, peanut butter, a lovely ingredient if you're okay with it. And it's an excellent um, addition to sauces, peanut butter. And lastly, uh, the last three, we've got sesame seeds, uh, often found in bread, sprinkled on a hamburger buns, for example. Uh, soya, uh, found in bean curd, edamame beans, miso paste, texture soy protein. Uh, again, quite a few products there is found in. And lastly, number 14, sulfur dioxide or sulfites. Used a lot in dried fruits. Um, as a preservative, it's um, if I raise in dried apricots, prunes, you'll find it in wine, beer, cider. Again, it's added to the product to kill off the yeast, um, so it doesn't give you a cloudy product. So those are the 14 allergens. Always check the ingredients uh, if you suffer from uh, allergic reaction to any of these foods. Always read the ingredients on the menu. Uh, sorry, on the ingredients list on the food. And always make sure that the food you're putting on in your uh, food business um, is well listed um, and covers all the allergens that might be in the food. Powers of authorised of officers. Uh, used to be called environmental health officers, now called environmental health practitioners. They can inspect food, they can enter premises at any reasonable time of the day or night, and that means um, at a time the business is usually operating. They can provide advice on an informal letter. They can provide training. They can serve a notice. They can close the premises. They can seize and detain food. They can instigate a prosecution. But don't forget it's the courts to prosecute. They can seize or detain records. They can take or purchase samples, and it is an offence to obstruct them. Duties include dealing with food premises inspection, food poisoning, food complaints, food hygiene training, food incidents or alerts, planning or licensing, registration, the home authority, is the home authority deals with a particular area. Um, so say, for example, if you've got uh, a local council covering a particular city, the environmental, officer, the environmental health officers um, would be employed by that city council. Um, if it's outside the city, then it would be um, a different council or authority. Uh, Trading standards officers are authorised officers. But they deal with the composition of food, they deal with labelling, and they deal with the weight and volume of it's easy for me to say again, adulteration. So it's the EHPs deal with the food safety aspects more than anything, and it's the, the food quality is dealt with by the TSOs. Um, so with an inspection of food premises, um, the purpose of the inspection is to establish hygienic handling. Establish if food is safe to eat, um, if they suspect food poisoning. The scope of the business, to assess the effectiveness of the HACCP system, to check standards have been achieved, um, whether legal and industry guides. Identify training needs of staff, to, in other words, a competency, to provide advice, make recommendations, to respond to a complaint, to revisit, to continually improve food hygiene standards and to ensure the business complies with the law. And uh, I don't think it's mentioned on these slides to award them uh, a number of between uh, one and five, which they must by law put on uh, visual display for customers um, in their shop window or somewhere that's conspicuous so they can people to see what they've scored. Where five is the top score, the best score, which is very good, and four is good. And I would advise all customers, don't go into any restaurants, takeaways, cafes, pubs, where they've got um, a food hygiene mark below four, because you're asking for trouble. Because you need to be asking yourself, why have they only scored three, two, or one? 
um, there's obviously serious issues. The best places to go into are the ones that scored five, obviously. Um, four is not too bad. It's normally not a serious issue, but certainly nothing below four. And the food law code of practice and guidance. Uh, prior to inspection, uh, they tend to the um, EHPs, etc. Tend to look at the premises history, uh, the time they've been in existence, and the time that they need to visit. The, equip the equipment they'll need to actually go there. They might need uh, temperature probes. They might, might need swabs. They might need analyzing equipment. Uh, what protective clothing they need to wear and any additional expertise they need to take with them. The frequency of inspection depends on the type of premises, the nature of the food, the degree of handling, the size of the business, the type of the customer, the current level of compliance, the management confidence, the history of compliance, and the control systems in place. Again, there's more details of uh, this in the notes. So, here we are, the key points of the last section. Uh, the main requirements of the Regulation 852-2004 on the hygiene of foodstuffs uh, was looked at. Uh, the main requirements of the Food Hygiene England regs include temperature control, notices, orders, offences and the due diligence defence. The purpose of codes of practice and industry guides and the Food Safety Act 1990 and the investigation of food complaints, the legislation regarding the labelling and decoding of food, and the powers and duties of authorised officers, EHPs, EHOs and Traded Standards Officers, the inspection of food premises by EHPs, EHOs and indeed by TSOs. So let's have a look at what we've actually gone through, a bit of a summary if you like. Our lecture 1 was an introduction to food safety. Lecture 2 was about microbiology. Uh, let's look at the key points again. Food poison bacteria are common in all food businesses. They require food, moisture, time, suitable pH to multiply. Most path pathogenic bacteria prefer 20 to 50 degrees C, uh, classed as meso or mesophiles. They can double in number in as little as 10 minutes. Temperatures above 75 degrees C are used to destroy, although as I've already mentioned, Temperatures above 60 degrees C, or in fact 57 degrees C, can destroy pathogens. Some toxins and spores can survive boiling for several hours. Most food poison bacteria do not grow below 5 degrees C. High acid, salt and sugar stop multiplication of bacteria because they act as natural preservatives. And there are various methods of identification of specific bacteria. <coughs> Excuse me. Lecture 3, we looked at food contamination and control. The key points there, sources include people, raw foods and pests. I just need to take a drink. Let's let my throat drying up. Vehicles include hands, equipment and cloths. We looked at the routes taken by contaminants to reach high-risk foods. We can disrupt route by good design, practice, disinfection and cleaning. We looked at physical or foreign body from packaging, equipment, structure, people, pests and customers. We looked at chemical contamination, how we can occur during growth, processing, preparation, transport or sale. That took us neatly on to uh, lecture four, which is food poisoning. And we looked at bacteria are the most common cause of food poisoning. We looked at an understanding of the sources, food vehicles, <coughs> excuse me, incubation periods. Symptoms and controls of common food poisoning organisms. We looked at chemicals, metals, poisonous plants and fish and how they can cause serious problems in the food industry. We found out that spores and some toxins are yeast resistant. We looked at the role of management and EHOs or EHPs in outbreak investigation. Then after lecture 4 we had lecture 5, foodborne disease. Key points there, uh, we looked at the difference between this and food poisoning, where only a small number of organisms are required to cause a problem. Multiplication of food is not essential. A boon and person to person spread is common. Pets, farm animals and birds are a common source of foodborne disease organisms. Compilobacter is the most common cause of diarrhoea in the UK today. 
Listeria can multiply significantly in a fridge. And we looked at the Pennington report recommendations, although I did mention to check out the notes for more details of that report. Lecture 6, six then was all about personal hygiene, where we see that most people carry food poison organisms from time to time. <coughs> Excuse me. We looked at the role of management in securing high standards of personal hygiene and preventing contamination of food. We looked at the characteristics of protective clothing. Training should result in competency. Planned training is essential, that's the training programme. Training records should be maintained. We looked at the legal requirements relating to personal hygiene and training. We looked at staff selection and the importance of medical screening and exclusion. And the awareness of the requirements of the Department of Health guidelines, food handlers, fitness to work, and again, there's more detail in the notes that accompanies this course. Lecture 7, Food Storage and Temperature Control. The major hazards are contamination, multiplication, survival, toxins and spores. And we found out that good stock rotation is essential, first in, first out. It's illegal to sell or use food after it's used by date. We looked at canned defects, chilled food storage. 1 to 4 degrees C, legal maximum is 8 degrees C. We looked at the thawing of raw meat and poultry. We looked at vacuum packs. Uh, we looked at sous vide and how vacuum packs require refrigeration due to the anaerobic bacteria that might be present. Uh, we looked at cooking food and reheating to 75 degrees C. And for some peculiar reason, uh, we found that in Scotland it's 82 degrees C. Um, but it has to do with the, uh, the pressure up there or what, I'm not sure. And storing at 63 degrees C if held hot. Uh, cool hot food rapidly, then refrigerate. Temperature control after process is critical. And we looked at the cook chill, cook freeze and sous vide cook chill processes. <coughs> oh, excuse me again. Lecture 8, we looked at food spoilage and preservation. And the key points there. We found that spoilage commences immediately after harvesting, slaughter or fishing. Spoilage may be due to enzymes, bacteria, moulds, yeasts or pests. And those come up a bit quickly then. Uh, rancidity or oxidation um, is uh, a damage, physical damage, bruising or ice formation or tainting uh, are all caused uh, by uh, either spoilage bacteria or through uh, damage by the food handler. And the rate of spoilage varies with temperature, number of organisms, type of food, competition, acid alkaline balance, available water and the atmosphere. Preservation slows spoilage and multiplication of pathogenic organisms. And low and high temperatures uh, are methods of preservation, such uh, as well as dehydration, chemicals, controlled atmospheres, the botulinum cooking canning, 121 degrees C for three minutes or more, uh, which would be the core temperature of the food. Uh, then lecture 9, design and construction of food premises and equipment. Key points, we looked at site selection, good design and materials are essential. We looked at segregating clean and dirty, raw from high risk. Having a linear continuous workflow. Suitable washing and disinfecting facilities. Potable or drinking water. Must be well lit and ventilated. Must be suitable drainage and waste management. Equipment must be clean and in good condition and maintained in such a way. And use of colour coding where appropriate. Use of colour coding with preparation boards, knives and with cleaning materials. Uh, took us neatly on to lecture 10, cleaning and disinfection. Uh, there we found that effective cleaning and disinfection is essential. In fact, to prevent uh, food poisoning. Cleaning presents significant hazards when carried out badly. Um, cleaning should reduce the risk of contamination. Must reduce the risk of contamination. Staff, staff involved in cleaning must be trained in cleaning. We need to disinfect food and hand contact surfaces only. Don't need to do the floors, walls and ceilings. And also disinfect cleaning equipment regularly and always after use. Good cleaning schedules help ensure effective cleaning and assist in due diligence. And effective monitoring is essential to ensure safe food. Lecture 11, 
integrated pest management key points there pests can spread diseases many prosecutions and closures result from pest problems staff training to recognize and respond to signs of pests is essential proofing and good housekeeping prevent many problems physical controls are preferred to chemical controls competent contractors are required for chemical control and we always need to monitor the pest control contractor Vector 12, all about supervisory management. And there we looked at how managers have a key role in food safety. Standards ensure consistency and customer satisfaction. Food safety policies should demonstrate the company's commitment to operate high standards and produce safe food. Quality control is reactive and quality assurance is proactive. HACCP or hazard analysis systems identify hazards. The implementation of controls and monitoring and corrective action. It provides documentation, verification and review to ensure safe food production. And bacteriological monitoring and sampling assists in the provision of food safety. And the last lecture we just went through food safety legislation. The key points. Uh, we looked at the main requirements of regulation EC 852-2004 on the hygiene of foodstuffs. The main requirements of the Food Hygiene England regs 2006 included temperature control, notices, orders, offences and the due diligence defence. The purpose of codes of practice and industry guides. The Food Safety Act 1990 and the investigation of food complaints. Legislation regarding the labelling and date coding of food. Um, we also covered the, um, the allergens, the 14 allergens uh, that must be displayed. And we looked at the powers and duties of authorised officers, such as the HPs and TSOs. And we looked at the inspection of food premises by EHPs and TSOs. So thank you for following this course. Uh, the important things to do now are to put into practice what you have learned, to increase awareness of food safety, but most importantly, to pass examination. But examination is only a certificate at the end of the day. It's the first two of the, the main uh, things you need to put into practice. Um, this course, plus the notes that come with it, uh, should have increased your competency. Uh, by the time you read through, plus redo the slides again, when you read through the notes, you will learn a lot about food safety. Um, so good luck in the future and I hope you enjoyed the course.